Buddy, happy new year. Come on. Now I have a Roethlisberger shirt on today because this weekend, Monday night, Lakeley is going to be his last week ever on, at Heinz Field. I mean, we've had 18 years of a guy left all kind of body parts all over Pittsburgh for us. So I just want to celebrate someone who had that kind of career. If you're a Pittsburgh fan, you've had two Hall of Fame quarterbacks, Bradshaw, Roethlisberger. We've been blessed in Pittsburgh. Come on, we're blessed. Just imagine if you were a Cleveland Browns fan. We have some of those in our church. They love God, have no wisdom, but they love God. And worse yet, a, a Detroit Lions fan. I don't even know if they make those anymore. But anyway, I just thought it would be fun to celebrate somebody who's been so great to our city. And let me tell you something that you may not know about Ben and his wife, Ashley. They, they walk with God and and they, what they do, they do privately, and most will never know. But they support ministries all over the place. A board that I serve on, um, they've been a great uh, help to them. And, and, uh, and God's doing a, a great thing in their life. And so I just trust that as he takes these next steps, God just uses him to further his kingdom and that family in a wonderful way. So, uh, but, but hopefully we'll, we'll get two more wins, and God will curse the Ravens and the Bengals. And we can get in the playoffs, and that would be good. You said God doesn't curse football teams. Yeah, 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 he does. Yeah, yeah, he's a Steelers fan. He loves the people on the team, just hates the team. But, hey, want to welcome our online audience. We love you so much. And so, Cranberry, would you welcome the online audience with us today? We love you guys. Thank you for joining, it, joining us today. Both in Meadville and in Newcastle, Pastor Sean up in Meadville and Pastor John in uh, Newcastle are doing their own services today as they just lay out the heart of God for their individual cities this first uh, weekend of the year. And so we're so grateful for what God's doing, one church, multiple locations. And the message title today is pretty simple, but, I, but uh, my hope is that, it, that it, it really gets into the depths of what God wants to do, not just through you, but for you. And it's simply this, God's vision for my new year. God really doesn't have, have a... Now, we put things in year sections. Everybody loves New Year's for one reason, because God put it in the heart of humans to want to start and begin again. It's, see, when you give your life to Jesus, you are called being born again. It's, a, it's literally a brand new start, a person that never existed before when you give your life to Jesus. It's baked into the DNA of the human makeup, the very image of God in you that desires something new. So people love the new year. It's why gym memberships go crazy in the month of January. And people who go to the gym all year will not go in January. They wait until people like me stop going in February. And then they come back. And people like me pay for their gym membership all year. But here's the reality. And my, here's my hope for you. Is that you understand that God has a purpose for your life. And the new year is a great time in the season of our lives to kind of pivot and say, I want to yield to what he has for me. I'm not asking you or would I even suggest you to make resolutions. Because resolutions depend on you. And how many of you found out most of those resolutions aren't very resolute? Particularly, well, how many of you have said, hey, this year I'm going to drop and you, some number of weight, of pounds, of whatever. You get to the end of the year and you go, next year. <laughs> but here's what I want to help you to see. What is God's vision in two areas? What is his vision for you as a part of a church? What is his vision for Victory Family Church in 2022? And then what is his vision for your individual life in 2022? And how do these two th things clearly intersect in the Bible? How you can't have one without the other. Now, the, the vision for God's kingdom and your part in it should always come first in your life. But I want to walk you through some of this. In, in the scripture, there's a leaders meeting we find in the book of Acts by, done by the Apostle Paul. Paul had gone to the city of Ephesus and he started a church. He planted a church there. There were no Christians there. And when he got to Ephesus, there were 12 people that the church started with. Three and a half years later, there are 25,000. How many of you know God wants to reach some people? People say the day of God reaching great churches and having great large churches is over. It started that way, and he still wants people. I don't care if you put him in a 1,000 homes, but get people. Just wherever they're at, grow the kingdom. And so Paul is about to leave Ephesus. He'd been there three and a half years, so he did what, what is wise. He pulled the leaders together. 
Those who had a ministry capacity within the, the church, uh, they, they were people that were called elders, if you will. They had a calling on their life. Some, of course, were separated to ministry. Some, I'm sure, worked in a very secular way. But Paul pulled all those leaders together, and he left them with a, a final leadership message. If you want to find what I, what I consider the most clearly written leadership lesson in, in the book of Acts, and really in the New Testament, is when Paul, in Acts chapter 20, teaches all the leaders that, that came together in, 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 in the city of Ephesus. Now, I'm only going to read you one verse, because it shows you the intersection of God's vision for you in his kingdom, and God's vision for your personal life. Paul said this in Acts 20, 24. He said, but none of these things move me. That's the test and trials that he's been going through. And nor do I count my life dear to myself. So that, now here's what I want you to see. I might finish, say out loud finish. I might finish my race with joy and finish the ministry which I've received from the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God. I want you to see two aspects of God's vision for your life. The first, he said, is your ministry. And the second is your own journey, your own race. You say, well, I'm not in ministry. I'm not a pastor or something like that. You th when you hear ministry, people think of maybe someone speaking on a weekend. This is a, a very narrow part of God's family, God's kingdom, and God's service. People that are set apart to do these type of things. But all of us have a ministry call within the context of the mission of Jesus in the earth. And it's unique to you. It's unique to your world. And God has a distinct vision for how he wants to use you in your everyday world. But right alongside that, he has a purpose for your individual life. And, and I want you to see that Paul was saying, God wants you to finish your race, that's your personal life, your walk with God, all that he has for you, all the intimacies of your life with joy. Say out loud, joy. But he said, I also want you to finish your ministry service, the things I put you on earth that will last forever. I want you to finish that as well. And yet for most people, when they think of fulfilling God's will for their life, religion seeps in and immediately they think it's hard. Oh, what do I have to give up? Most people see serving God as what I give up that I want to do and what I have to do that I hate to do. And it's that lie and that deception that pushes people back from the purpose of God. It's such a lie, it's such a deception. And here's, here's the bottom line. If you don't understand the why, say it out loud, the why. If you don't understand the why of God's vision for your ministry life, what you do for him in the earth, beyond your life, that lasts beyond your life. If you don't understand what motivates God or his why for that and your personal race, you will never, ever, ever, ever fulfill what you were meant to do on this earth. You will, you will innately push away from God and you won't know why. Until you know God's why, the price is always too high. Until you get this, you will turn a relationship with a God that desperately loves you into nothing but mere religion and nonsense. And I want to help you not to do that today. Love is God's why in my life, in your life, for the ministry of my life, the calling of my life, whatever that is for you, whatever that is for me, and my personal race. Because here's the reality. God will lead you nowhere in either one of those realms where love wouldn't lead you. I'm going to say that again. God will lead you nowhere that love would not lead you. And the foundational question that you have to answer, and do, as do I, do I really believe this about God? Do I believe that his lordship is the one of love? Because would he, would, 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 if God's leading me, he would only lead me where love would lead me, and love only does what's in the best interest of the other. This is why for many Christians... They seek to make Jesus the savior of their life. They want to go to heaven, but not their Lord. They don't want to follow him in everyday life because they think it's hard. They think it's uh, where you're actually being punished. Uh, hundreds of times through the years, and you may have said this yourself or heard it said, somebody will be in a conversation and they'll say something like, man, I would never want to go to, and they name some God-forsaken part of the world that they consider God-forsaken. I would never go there. I would never want to go there. And somebody invariably will say this, don't say that. God will make you go there. Because you know God, he's waiting to find out what will make you hate life the most and then tell you to do it. Just like any other parent would do, right? That's what parents do for their kids. We say, hey, I hope you, I want to make you hate your life. Come on. No decent parent thinks. But see, people push away from God. Every word in the Bible screams. I mean, it screams the why of God. 
And without this understanding, you're going to turn the passion of God for you, your purpose, your ministry life. That is the purpose to, to bring Jesus to the world around you in a way that would be, be, be congruent and natural for you. And this individual walk with God of intimacy, you'll turn it into a dead religion. And nobody wants to live in something dead. So let me ask you this. How would you feel if you're a parent, maybe an aunt, uncle, maybe a grandparent, somebody that you have influence in someone's life that's younger and you really love them and you're trying to give them advice and they reject your advice, that would be one thing because, you know, you're not perfect. Maybe you're wrong. But it's one thing to reject your advice. But what if they said this to you? Why do you want me to do this? Are you trying to hurt me? Are you trying to take away the joy of my life? Are you trying to make my life difficult? Is that why you're giving me this advice? How many of you, forget being offended, how many of you, if it's truly someone you desperately love, and particularly if you're a parent, you know the price you've paid, how many of you as a parent would be devastated by your child doubting your motive for why you told them to do something? It would devastate you. And yet as Christians, by and large, that's how we look at God. Now, God, let me say it this way. Uh, he, he makes you an offer that uh, you, uh, you shouldn't refuse. He really does. And it's a Godfather thing. If you've never, never watched The Godfather, it's a sad thing, but that's okay. God really has made us an offer that we can refuse, but we shouldn't. In the movie The Godfather, it's a Christmas movie, by the way. I don't know if you know that. <laughs> Just Godfather 1. Godfather 3 is not real, so forget that one. And anyway, so... Johnny Fontaine comes back from, from Hollywood to, this, to the Godfather's only daughter's wedding. And he's in the office with the Godfather. And he's complaining about what's going on in Hollywood. And how everything's gone bad for him. And he, he has this movie that he could be in. And if he gets this part, everything would be great. And then he starts to cry. And, he's, and the Godfather shakes him. And he smacks him. And he says, shut up and stop crying like a woman. Act like a man. They make you a Hollywood woman. What's the matter with you? And he said, go out there, get something to eat. You look terrible. He said, in this Hollywood big shot, he's going to give you this part. And he says, it's not possible. He said, there's no chance. No chance. He said, I'm going to make him an offer that he can't refuse. You know, the horse head thing in the bed, he got the part. <laughs> yeah, he did. God makes you an offer that you can refuse. And sadly, a great majority of God's children do refuse it because they've been lied to about God. And I want to take you into a place in the book of Revelation. There, there are seven churches in the book of Revelation that, that Jesus literally spoke to through the apostle John and said, write these words. And there were seven literal churches in Asia Minor, today modern day Turkey. And of those churches, he would tell them things that they were doing well, things they needed to correct. And some of them were really in bad shape. What I'm about to read you is not written to one of the churches that were on an upswing. This was written to one of the churches that were struggling. And interestingly enough, the struggle this church had is the struggle the American church is having right now. You see, sometimes we think God offers intimacy with us when we get to a place of perfection. But it's just the other way around. Even though God in the book of Revelation, Jesus told them the things that they needed to adjust, he ended it in a very intimate way. And the offer that he made them is made to you and it's made to me. But I want you to understand it's made to a group of people in Pergama. The, 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 in, they lived in the city of Pergama, the Pergamus, the Pergamus church. And they had adopted a doctrine called the doctrine of the Nicolaitan. Not Nicolodian, the Nicolaitan, okay? The word, it comes from the, uh, the original of the Greek word where we get the word Nicholas. It means conquered or conqueror. And here's what that doctrine was. And he mentions it in a couple of the letters. And Jesus literally said, I hate that doctrine. God rarely uses the word hate. It's a strong word. If God hates something, you want to mark it. But why would he hate it? Your religious mind says, oh, next thing he's going to judge you. He hates it because it harms you. He said, the, I hate that doctrine. And then he said this, and I hate the works that it produces in my people. Here's the simplicity of the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. And it, it, it just simply is this. It's in this doctrine is when a person is governed by the culture, and they're conquered by the culture. That's all it is. He said, this is a time where, where, where it's a belief system, belief system that drives into the heart of the Christian that they let the culture and even the kingdom of darkness 
conquer and dominate how they live, listen, their everyday life and how they walk with God. It was a, a church to where Jesus was their savior, but some other influence became their Lord. It's what's happening in the American church right now where Christians want Jesus to save them, but they, they have replaced a spirit and passion of faith with a spirit of anger and rage and a righteous indignation about 66 issues. And all 66 can be legitimate. And he said, and you're letting that dominate you. It's become the Lord of your life, and I hate it. Why would God hate it? When you see what he said to them, you'll find out why. Let me take you into this amazing opportunity that is available for, listen, people that are struggling. This is not written to the, to the guy or the lady on the upswing in their spiritual life. Man, I've had six months. I'm doing great with God. This is somebody who the culture has messed you over. Anybody had a little messed over time in the culture lately? Yeah. Listen to, listen to what he said. In Revelation 2, 17 to the church at Pergamon, he said, anyone. Say it out loud, anyone. That means anyone. Anyone with ears to hear must listen to the Spirit and understand what he is saying to the churches. He said, you've got to open your ears to this. You're listening to something else. You, if you have an ear to hear, listen. Jesus is talking. Listen to me, please, is what he's saying. To everyone who overcomes and is victorious. And then he names some things. When you hear, see the word overcome and victorious, he doesn't mean over every issue of life. He's talking about people that have overcome the doctrine of the, of the Nicolaitans. Those of you that have decided that that's not going to be the Lord of your life, that these cultural things, these, these demonic issues in the world, a world set ablaze of hell will not shape your direction, will not be the voice that you give heed to, will not be the works that are born out of your life from. He said to the one who has decided to walk with me and let me be the Lord of their life, listen to what he offers you. He said, I will give him, say out loud, give. It doesn't say earn. I don't know how, God help me. God help me to get this in people's hearts. God gives, you don't earn. Lose the religious nonsense that you have to work for something for God. You can't work that hard. And he's talking to people that are messed over by the culture. Listen to what he said. I will give him some of the hidden manna to eat. And I will give him a white stone. And on the stone will be engraved a new name. Now listen, that no one understands. Listen to this intimacy, except the one who receives it. I want you to see what God offers. And this is an offer none of us should refuse. I don't care if, you've, if you're struggling so much in your walk with God that you just think, man, God, I, I just, just don't, you think he's trying to kill you. Or maybe you don't even know God. Maybe you don't want to. Maybe you've been shaped your view of him through the lies and nonsense of dead religion instead of a living God that loves you and a savior that died for you. And he said, there are three things I want you to understand that I have for you. Not you perfect ones, you ones that have been trapped in this silly doctrine, this doctrine that I hate because it's destroying your life. I have hidden manna for you. I have a white stone for you. And on that white stone, I've written a name for you that only you and me will ever know. Billions of people and yet he has the intimacy to write a name that's just you and him. What an offer. Hidden manna. Now, if you know the Old Testament of all, you know when the children of Israel escaped Egyptian bondage and were in the, in, the, in the desert, God, through the leadership of Moses, he began to rain down manna from heaven. It was a type of bread. It was, they, they had no food. There was no way for them to sustain themselves. And this manna was a substance from God to sustain human life that man had nothing to do with. It was a pure gift. And it, and it rained down every day. Every day, God did that for a period of years to feed them, and it was supernatural. And God's saying, listen, the Nicolaitans want you to follow their manna. I have something hidden, not from you, but for you. And there's an intimacy that if we gather together, I have a hidden manna for you, a substance that isn't from the earth that will equip you, that will endow you, that will literally empower you to live your life in the manner in which I call you to live it. And he literally told them, he said, I've reserved this for you. Now, certainly he means the whole church, but this is very specific. 
for your ministry life, the things I've called you to do that will matter, that you will not live a satisfied life without when living beyond the, the, the scope of your own world and serving outside of the soap, scope of your own world. And then your personal journey. Do you know there is hidden manna in, for your marriage? Because that's your personal race. For your family, for your kids. For when life hits you and it, and, and it falls down around you, one moment everything's fine, and in a moment your world changes. There is no manna in this world for that, but there's a hidden manna for you. That no matter what you face in this world, he said, I have a hidden manna for you that will sustain you in this life. It is God's word over your life. It is God's purpose over your life that is superior to everyone else's purpose and opinion. I think we have no trouble saying that God's purpose would be greater than the enemy or, the, or Satan's kingdom or, or the world set of blaze of hell. But the one we struggle with is God's purpose really greater than my own, what I think I should do. The book of Proverbs says it this way, there is a way that seems right, seems right to a man, but the end of that way is death and destruction. Well, God's going to judge me. No, no, no. The absence of God's power, plan, and provision is destruction by definition. He said, don't choose it. Don't choose to walk away from a gift. And he said, the purpose I have for you exceeds even what you would think would be best for you, even above those that love you. You know, in the Bible, James and John were brothers. Their father was named Zebedee. James and John were, uh, were the original 12 apostles, two of the 12. And they were in a fishing business with their father. Jesus calls them to follow him, and they leave the fishing, biz fishing business in a moment, and they're gone. I promise you that Zebedee at that moment didn't think it was a good move. He had responsibilities. Those boys had responsibilities as partners. And all of a sudden, they left it. And I'm sure Zebedee, and see, Jesus did not have the greatest of reputations. They killed him for it, remember? I'm sure Zebedee was like, what are you doing? Who's going to do this? What do you mean you're leaving the business? You see, the manna that Zebedee had for his sons could never match what Jesus had for them. But he didn't, it wasn't that he didn't love them. He could only give the manna that a human can give. I know my own life with my dad, and he's, in, he's been in heaven for I, I, 12 years plus, I guess. And, and he was just kind of rough around the edges. I don't even know if he had edges. He just was rough. And I miss him a lot. And when he died, I lost half my material because he was funny. And uh, but my dad, you know, was helping. When I started traveling in ministry before he pastored, I was speaking in churches, and, and it sounds larger than it was. They were just a handful of people in a building. I mean, sometimes 30, 40 people at the most. And I was, I mean, I was so poor, poor people were sending me money. No, they weren't, but they, they would have if they knew. I was living in my car. And my dad is watching me live this way. And he's, 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 at that time, he's really not walking with God very much at all. And, and, and he, but he's helping me. He's doing the checkbook for me, which didn't take much, wasn't much there. And every time I'd call back, I'd be at someone's house. Some of you are too young to remember this, but there was a time without cell phones. There was a time when you had to make collect phone calls or put it on a credit card and dial all these numbers. And you were stuck on a cord and you couldn't get away from people. It, nothing wireless. And I would be in somebody's house on their phone. And my dad, I would call him and I'd say, hey, dad, listen, um, and I, I'm telling you, I nothing. And the little bit I would have over and over and over again, I would call and say, dad, I need you to write a check and send it to such and such a work, a ministry, whatever. And instead of my dad going, well, son, absolutely. Let's pray together over that gift. <laughs> he would start cussing. <laughs> and I won't say what he said, but you can fill in the blanks with all the beeps and it would just be one boo. What in the, beep, boop, 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 are you kidding? Beep, 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 beep. You can't keep giving away this money. What's wrong with you? Stop this. I said, Dad, just please just send. Now I'm pushing the phone to my ear. Some of you don't well, know what this means, but though, some of y'all do. Somebody yelling, they can hear in his voice. Listen, he's been dead 13 years. If he yelled now in the grave, you'd hear him. And I'm pushing the phone against my head. So, he, you know, and, and I'm, you know, I'm kind of laughing because it just, as I got older, he got to be kind of funny when I would tick him off. But, you know, he wasn't saying that because he hated me. He just hated the, 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 what he was seeing me live without. We went to Africa, Michelle and I. We came back to start Victory in 1993. And when we came back, my dad, because he was a part of this, he knew that we had given everything away again. And it just ticked him off. 
because Michelle was pregnant with, with, with our son. And we didn't have, listen, when I said we didn't have a dollar to our name. We didn't have a dollar. So that, that's ridiculous. I'm not suggesting that God would lead you to do that. Probably never would. But he led us to do it over and over and over again. I'm trying to help you to see hidden manna isn't what people think it is all the time. And so my dad said, what are you guys going to do now? And I said, dad, we're going to pastor a church in Cranberry Township. And here's what he said. Finally, something secure. Tell me about the church. Well, it doesn't exist. We're going to start it. Beep, 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 son of people and all kinds of things. He's saying, what? So can't you do anything easy? God. What do you mean it doesn't exist? How do you start a church? I go, I, I don't know. <laughs> so we were having some brief meetings before the church would begin. And my dad loved me. I, I know he loved me. He just raw. And, and he and my mom were driving up from where they lived, about 40 minutes from here in Beaver County. And they drove up for these meetings. And as they drove here, they passed this beautiful, small little church. And my mom told me years later that every time we'd drive by there, he would say, maybe someday God would let John and Michelle pastor something like this. And it was all the manna he could see for me. Because all he was seeing was not the purpose, but his son and his needs. And so I want you to see the picture of that church. And that's the church that he, that, that would have been the outcome of my entire life. And all he could see was, can they, can they, be, can they survive? But what was on the other side of the hidden manna? What's this? What's the picture you see behind you? That's what God saw, and it's not a building. It's a purpose. Instead of a building that literally was maybe three to 4,000 square feet, there's more square feet on this platform. They said, well, are you saying it's, that small is bad? I didn't, no, please don't misinterpret this. I'm telling you that what my father, who loved me, desired for me, was so far beneath what my heavenly father desired to go through me. See, human love is what I want for you. The God kind of love is what I want through you because to pass through you, it also has to be for you. And at the end of the day now, there's two campuses. There'll be more. Kingdom builders touching the world. In the next decade, we will see a thousand churches planted in the Northeast. The hidden manna is amazing. The hidden manna for your life is amazing. And it isn't for perfect people. It's for people that he perfectly loves. So why is it that we think the price of finding this hidden manna is too high? Oh, how religion has lied to us. Let me say this to you. The cost of not finding the hidden manna is greater than anything you ever pay. Jesus, in fact, told us that if we don't find our purpose in this life, if we don't let the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the one who knows the end from the beginning to govern our life. He said, if you don't let me, the one who knows it all, take you where I've called you to be because I've already been there. Your life will be wasted on this earth. You will never have meant, to, you will never have done and, and accomplished with the, the world and the purposes I gave you. And this is what Jesus said about it in Luke chapter 14. He calls the believer salt, which is a preservative. He said, salt, that's the believer that's useful for the earth, is good. But if the believer loses its saltiness or its purpose for the earth, there's no way to make it salty again. And it's no good for the earth or for the manure pile. And it's thrown away. And again, Jesus said, he that has ears to hear, let him hear. He said, open your ears and listen to me. Anything you do apart from my plan, in your purpose of your life, even in your individual race, compared to what I have for you, the hidden manna that I have for you, it's a manure pile. He said, and I've given you a white stone, the second thing. And that white stone is always representative. White is righteousness. He said, I've granted you right standing with the Father through my son. I died for you. I call you righteous as if sin never existed before. Imagine walking with God without a sense of inferiority. That's what he means. Righteousness is the ability to stand before God without a sense of inferiority. That's what he granted to you in Christ. And then he said, I've given you a new name. And this is so intimate though. He, yet he said, but this name has to be received. Say out loud, received. You have to choose to receive this name. You have to receive this name. That means you have to be intimate with God where you hear his voice and you eat of that manna. 
and you accept the righteousness that is a gift and not earned. And then he has a name for you that only God and you will know. Imagine the intimacy of that. That's an offer no one should ever refuse. You know, I've, I, I, I'm, I'm kind of an odd person, just am. And so I make up names for my kids all the time. Just weird names. I don't know where they come from, but they stick, and I just call them that, and they know what it means. My daughter, Alexa, our youngest, was, I, I, I started calling her Janice. I don't know what it means, where it came from, but I called her Janice for years. Janice! And so anyway, she's on the pom-pom thing at, at Seneca Valley. Seneca Valley Band is remarkable, and it was this dance thing in the front, and it was, and for four years, she, they had, I went to every home and away game to watch my daughter. And at halftime, they would perform. Now, when a song was over, everybody would clap, and there would be dead silence. In that dead silence, for four years, without fail, this is what happened. Jonas! And the whole, I mean, it echoed, because it was dead silent. She knew, the, she knew the name. No one else did. But Steve Moore sitting beside me, and Rachel, his daughter, is on the team as well. And he would do this. Reach down! <laughs> For four years. And you could see it in both of the girls' eyes, the name they knew, which isn't quite like the name the father has for you. And there was this look in their eyes. You could see it from a distance. Oh, please shut up. <laughs> so much so that I did it so frequently that her friends started to figure it out and they called her Janice. Do you know God has a, that intimate of a name for you? Now, it's not to embarrass you at a football game. But do you know why I was crazy screaming her name? Because I'm crazy for her. And you say, well, did, weren't you embarrassed? I don't have that gene. <laughs> and where my kids are concerned, I have it not at all. For four years, I'm sure people were like, oh, that idiot. What does he keep doing that for? Shut up. I'm like, no, I won't. You. That's my Janice. I wanted to know I'm here, baby. Janice! Over and over again. He's calling your name. But not just a name that you know but a name that only you and he can know. It's so intimate. It's so intimate. It's so intimate. So I ask you this as we wind down this understanding. What name do you call yourself by? Are they positive names? Successful, thin, and in shape? It's January. We can pretend. <laughs> Prosperous, happy. All the things that you may want to define your life and names that you would give yourself that could define a good life. More times than not, we define ourselves by other names like uh, uh, alone, abandoned, divorced, broken, depressed, full of anxiety, sick. And we define our lives by all the things, I'm a failure, I don't do this right. And we put names over our life. And none of those names are his names. Listen, not the successful ones and not the failure ones. He has new names for you. And, he, and if, you'll, if you'll learn, and I'm going to give you very practically in, in less than three minutes how to do it. And there's a simple how. There's a simple how. It, this is not hard. It's simple. Because it isn't something you work for. It's a, this is a gift you receive. Gifts are easy when you receive them. They're not easy to buy. They're easy to receive. But here's the reality I want you to see. Is that God literally calls you loved. Unconditionally. If you heard him talk to you today, he'd whisper. I love you unconditionally. I love you unconditionally. I accept you in a world that rejects. I, I love you in a world that pushes people aside. You're mine. Mine. Do you know what that means when God says to a human, you're mine. I purchased you because I love you. I, I died for you not just, to, not just to save you, not just to wipe away your sin, but to call you my son and my daughter. If you're a woman, he says, I call you my daughter. If you're a son, he's like, I call you my son. And he's crazier about you than I am. All I did was yell, Genesis, he hung on a cross. What kind of love is this? If this love could ever capture my heart and I realized that his lordship was one of love, then I would see the names that he calls me, that he calls me free. He says, I've given you a divine purpose. I've given you an eternal impact and none of it is based on what good or bad has happened to you. It's all based on what I can do for you and through you because I love you. If you haven't discovered that hidden manna, if you haven't discovered what that white stone means, if you haven't heard the names 
that, and, and the one spe- there's a name he has for you. He said, well, I know that name. I don't know that we'll know the exact name, but I promise you there'll be an intimacy that it will define you and God will speak into your heart so clearly. Not when you get to heaven. He's writing this to people that are messed up in the culture right now. He's desperate. So I thought we're going to talk somewhat about the vision of victory. We are. It's no different than it's been. This will be our 29th year. It's to see people come to know Jesus in greater numbers than we've ever known. To see them become water baptized and filled with God's Holy Spirit. To see them find freedom in their life and discover their purpose and make an impact. To see us keep reaching out and touching the world. Helping other churches grow and do everything we can to expand God's amazing kingdom in the earth. That's what he's called us to do. This year he wants to see even in a greater way, not just in our services, but in our individual lives, the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit to do things in the power of God in the moment that no human could ever do for you. That's what he has for us, to expand what we do as kingdom builders. I'm so excited in a few weeks, a couple weeks, to be able to tell you what you did in, in, in the year before. It's amazing what you did in 2021. Can't wait to tell you. That's the vision of this church and mission, but it's absolutely irrelevant. If the people in this church aren't finding their hidden manna and their new name. So how do I practically do this? Very simply, make God first in your week this year. Unless you're on a vacation, you're going, I don't know, you have surgery or you're doing flying to Japan, whatever. Make coming the first day of the week together with God's people your priority and make it an immovable uh, if you will function in your life make him first God cannot be second if you want to live a life for God make him first it isn't that he won't be second he can't be second his name is first he's the alpha and the omega he's the beginning and the end make him first bring your kids with you and now here's something very practical you you can do and let's take this weekend for example the message that I just spoke will be is on YouTube right now on our YouTube channel. It's available on our website. And I'm sure it's available other places. I don't know how to get there. Throughout this week, when you're driving, instead of listening to some nonsense music or some talk show person that's going to make you furious, listen to the message again. Then every morning, do something very simple or at least a part of your day. Take 20 minutes. And just take what you would do this week. It would be this simple. In that 20 minutes, you start and you would simply pray something like this. Lord, I thank you. I, I, I hear your voice. I have ears to hear today. And, and I thank you for the hidden manna you have for my life. Thank you for your love for me. Thank you for the white stone you've given me of righteousness. I don't have to walk with you based on how I feel or how I, I did yesterday. But you've redeemed me. You've given me hidden manna. You've given, there's, there's things you want to speak to me. And as you just sit, pray and worship God and say, I thank you for that, and then get quiet, there'll be things you watch. If you'll just do it with any consistency at all, that will start to come up in your heart. Write down the hidden manna. One word from God can change your life. He can change generations of heartache in a, in a moment. But he said, I, I want you to have an intimacy with me so you could find the hidden manna. You can discover your righteousness, and you can hear the name that I call you. And, and, and finally, let me say this. I'm just showing you practically how to do it. I would pray and say, Lord, today, I will say nothing of myself that doesn't agree with the names you speak over me. No matter how I feel, I will honor you. I won't deny reality, but I will not call myself what you don't call me. So I feel so depressed. Don't ignore it. But the joy of the Lord is my strength. You are my strength and you are my joy. You're the glory and the lifter of my head. No matter how I feel, nothing's impossible with you. Because life isn't fair. If you'll just do that with consistency, and the last thing is be consistent, not perfect. So what if I, what if I don't do it for a couple weeks? Then start. Yeah, but then do I have to make it up? No. This is a relationship. You can't make it up. People that make it up in relationships end up divorced. Think that one through. If you don't start fresh in your marriage every day, you keep tabs. God help you, because that's a long tab if you've been married a long time. He said, every morning my mercies are brand new for you. Every morning, he's longing to give you hidden manna. So my hope for you this year is that that you, you, you discover 
the purpose of God for you in his kingdom and you give yourself to it. You discover that intimate place he has for you in every area of your life and just do it on a daily basis. Please make him first. Please accept the offer that you shouldn't refuse. And don't let religion and the doctrine of the Nicolaitans capture you as well and me. Because that's exactly what's happening in our world today. And I want to pray over your life. And I want to speak life over you. Father, I pray over your people. I speak your favor and blessing over them. Lord, we live in a world that is trying to capture the way we govern everyday life. It's such a lie. It's not who we are. Holy Spirit, we yield our hearts to you now in worship. We yield our hearts to you in worship. And we ask you to help us to see the graciousness that you are. Not that we have to strive for this, but that we have to submit to your love and receive from heaven. Thank you, my Father, for your great grace upon our lives. Would you stand together with me? And, and now in the presence of God, the person of the Holy Spirit wants to do a work individually in my life and yours. Whether you're a Christian or not, God loves you and he wants to show himself real to you right now in ways that will change your tomorrows. That's what he's here to do. And we worship him not to, 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 to talk him into anything, but he's worthy of it. He loves us so great, so amazingly. Lord, we thank you. And Lord, I thank you for the, for the, for the purpose of heaven in their life. I thank you for their individual race, their individual callings, and for this wonderful hidden manna in this precious secret name. We worship you. Come on, let's, let's worship together. We honor you, Father. We worship you. Come on, let's sing this out. I love you, Lord. I love you, Lord. Oh, your mercy never fails me. Oh, my dear. I've been held in your hands From the moment I wake up Until I lay my head Oh, I will say Of the goodness of God Come on, sing all my life
just worship him. We exalt him. Oh, you're worthy, Father. You are worthy, Lord. You are so good to us, God. We honor you. We exalt you. Come on, let's really lift him up. We set our focus on you, Lord. God, we adore you. We praise your name. Let's sing this out together. Every voice, I've heard a thousand stories that sings out.
life, your purpose. Thank you. We love you with everything in us. We worship you. I'm going to ask Michelle, honey, would you come up here for a minute? I, last night as we were worshiping God in the service, um, there's a word that came up in my heart that was actually centered on this message. Uh, but yesterday morning, Michelle came to me and she said, honey, I feel like God has given me one word for 2022. And we're we just, that really never happens with us. And so I've, we've been married a long time. She's never had a, had that happen. Not that it can't happen every year, it just never has. And, uh, and so what I was sharing, it came up in my heart and I, and I did my best to share what God had put in her heart. And I thought it would be better if she just shared what that meant to her when that one word came up in her heart. So, honey, if you would just share that, just take a minute and share it out of your heart. I was uh, praying yesterday, and uh, I don't normally, like John said, have a word for the year. I, You know, a lot of people have that, and I always envy that in a way. But I was just meditating on the word, and, and the Holy Spirit he just whispered to my heart. And he said, uh, he gave me a word, and he said, reawakened. That's the word I have for you for this year, and that's the word I have for victory this year, for people, you this year, if you're a part of victory. And I, and I looked up the meaning of that word, and one of the meanings of that word is to restore from depression, inactivity, and being unusable. And I was like, wow, all of us have been attacked in this area for the last three years. And the church has, in a way, become paralyzed if we look around the nation and we see what's going on. But you know what? God is, is, is he's breathing right now by spirit. And he's wanting to restore all of us back to a place of finding the purpose that he has for our lives in our walk with God. You know, we've gone back to working and, and go, gone. we've left the isolation that we had in 2020. But, you know, there's, there's residual from that. And I think the residual from it is that we have all become in a certain way depressed, inactive, unusable in certain ways. And I think God is wanting to do something this next year in a great way. And this is for the church and this is for the believer. It's not for unsaved people. And in a minute, we're going to give you a chance. If you don't know Jesus, like how John was talking today about the God who gives that hidden manna, he's so precious and he loves you. And we're going to give you a chance to know him. But this is for believers. And I looked up the scripture in Ephesians 5. 13 and 14 and it says but everything exposed by the light becomes visible and everything that's illuminated becomes a light this is why as it said wake up sinner rise from the dead and Christ will shine on you so I just want to go back to that one statement that in the word and it says and everything that is illuminated becomes a light well God's shining the light right now right now on all of us and he's saying Wake up, wake up, wake up to the purpose that I have for you. And you can either choose to wake up or you can still stay asleep as a believer. And I believe right now in this moment, right now, I just want everybody to close their eyes. And I want you to just get real with God right now where you are. And just between you and God and say, God, I want to wake up. I want to wake up to the purpose that you have for me. Because, you know, we hear a lot that we need to say desperately that we need God, but God desperately needs you. He needs you to fulfill your purpose on the earth, to shine that light through you to people that are lost and broken everywhere. And in this time of what we're experiencing, there's so much brokenness, so much loss in people, and God is de desperate for his body to obey him. And in their everyday life to shine that light because people yes. will be drawn to it. Thank you, so I just want you to say, if that's if that's you, raise your hand right now and acknowledge it before God. Nobody looking around. Nobody's looking around. Just get real with God and say, God, that's me. I felt depressed. I felt inactive. I felt unusable in the purpose of God for my life. And now God wants to just right now shine a light and illuminate and wake you back up to that purpose in his presence because it's only by his power only by his power that he can do something inside of us that no man can do and it's not by watching the news it's not by looking around at everything that's going on around us because it will only bring us to a place of of depression but it's by choosing to look at him and so father right now we just thank you that you are doing a work right now in the church that no man can do that only you can do I thank you for every person that raised their hand and or people that didn't raise their hands but feel that feel this way, Father, that you will illuminate to them 
your purpose for them, that you will illuminate to them the, the preciousness that you see them as, that they will see themselves that way, that they will rise up and they will become active and usable and filled with your light and joy to, to illuminate that around them in the world that they live in, Father God. I thank you, Holy Spirit, that this next year we declare in 2020, Lord, that it will, 2022, Lord, that it will be a year of illumination, of great light, that this body here, Victory Family Church, will increase. We will increase in every way, that we will prosper in every way, Father, and that there will be many, many lost people that will be won to Christ because we have chosen to awake to that light, and that light will bring light to the darkness around us and the people will want to know what we have inside of us because it's different from the world father so we just thank you i thank you for every person here and under the the name of victory family church lord that you will do a work in them and you will change us all from glory to glory from faith to faith in jesus name amen amen, amen. thank you honey stay with me you know I want to give everyone an opportunity here in a moment to pray with us to receive Christ, but God literally is saying, stop waiting for permission. God doesn't look for permission from human beings in the culture to go, to get out and do what he's called you to do. We don't need permission from anybody but God. And you go be who you're meant to be and you trust God. Let's go shake this world. Turn it upside down again with the love of the Father. And so the next six weeks, Michelle and I are going to be sharing together uh, we're calling them family values, but they're literally the values that built this church over almost 30 years. And they're very practical, but it will take you from where a word from God became this. There are values because once you know the values, the foundations, the decisions become easy. And we have six weeks that we're going to do some of those together. And I just hope that you'll let God give him this first part of your year. And let him build a great foundation in your heart. Because he wants to reawaken us, not for just us, but for a world without him. Amen. Would you bow your heads with me? We want to give everybody an opportunity to know Jesus with heads bowed and eyes closed. If you're here today or you're watching online and you've never given your life to Christ, if today you were to draw your final breath and slip into an eternity, do you know where you'd spend it? With every head bowed and eye closed, remember this. There are only two ways that you will approach death. You will die in your sin or you will die redeemed from your sin dying in your sin means that you've never received a savior and then you pay for the debt and the punishment on your own or you can receive the one who loved you and died for you and pay the debt that he didn't know and he turns no one away in the same book of revelation to the churches he wrote these words jesus said i stand at the door of your of your life and i knock he said if anyone will let me in i will come he turns no one away and i will dine with you that's so sacred and so intimate if you don't know that Jesus is the Lord of your life and not just your Savior, but you want to make him the Savior and Lord of your life, you've never given your life to Christ or you're not sure, say, Pastor, I want to be included in prayer to receive Jesus into my life. In a moment, I'll ask you to raise your hand right where you're standing. And then together, the whole church will pray the prayer out loud and together with you. Jesus will never leave you, never forsake you. So if, you, if you've never prayed that prayer before, if you, you're not certain if Jesus is the Lord of your life, you want to make him the Lord of your life. With every head bowed, every eye closed, would you just right now raise your hand where I could see it? Be bold about it. Do it right now, and I'm going to pray for you right where you're standing. Thank you. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. God bless you. Thank you, ma'am. God bless you. With these lights, there's certain folks that I'm sure I can't see, but you can put your hands back down. <clears throat> this includes those of you watching online. If you're going to pray with me, just put it in the comments. I'm praying with Pastor John now. Let's pray this together. And you're not praying some dead religious prayer. You're inviting the living Christ to come into your heart. He turns no one away. And your sin debt will be canceled. And you'll be heaven bound when you die because of Jesus. Pray it out loud where you hear it. And we're going to pray it together with you. Pray it where you hear it. Say, Heavenly Father, I come to you in the name of Jesus. And I believe with all my heart that Jesus is the Son of God. He died on a cross to bear my sin debt. I open the door of my life. And Jesus, I invite you in. I receive you now to be my Savior and Lord. Thank you for coming. I am now a child of God. My sin debt is canceled. And when I die, I am heaven bound because Jesus is the Lord of my life. Amen, amen, amen. Give them a hand, would you?